Right, good morning. The, the really good news is I'm not going to be head of the physics and astronomy department much longer, so I'll have a bit more time in the future. Uh, this is what I'm going to tell you about. Well, it isn't quite. I, I've added some more to the title because I thought we were a bit space limited. So it's now why we are interested in 2D modelling rather than the 2D modelling itself of transient phenomena in plasmas. And I've added a list of people who have made some kind of contribution to the details and the inspiration. So let me now go to uh, just a few more details about a particular experiment and, and some of these results are um, even uh, they're up to date because they were done this week. Um, this is a capacitively coupled discharge so there are two discs here or two, two cylinders facing each other with a 25 millimeter gap in them it's the GEC cell configuration except in the shower head of this upper ground electrode there's a structure like this which has got a central region and then an outer region. It looks as if it's made of two different metals and it once was, but in actual fact now it's only made of the same metal as here. There's a probe region and a guard ring region around the outside. It's all embedded in, so, and it's made of the same materials that are there. So it doesn't introduce any new materials. And it, it for me, is a, is a slightly more relaxed way of uh, assessing what's going on electrically in the plasma because you're staying in the wall using what's already committed to the wall materials rather than putting a probe into the volume and causing lots of perturbations. Uh, now, what happens next? So when you put the plasma on in a system like this, these are other probes sticking in there, it looks something like that. Uh, and then, uh, to do, oh, sorry, that was a gratuitous advertising uh, using the same picture. Uh, it uh, then goes on to... To this. I want to look in at that region there where that's, there is this region around the probing area in the ground electrode of a capacitively coupled plasma. Just want to see what's going on there when I, I use this as a probe. And to use it as a probe, rather than apply DC because it gets insulating coatings on it, we, we use RF to bias it because the RF is rectified by the plasma around here, automatically creates some DC voltages for you. So that region in here is that region over there. And when you apply bursts of radio frequency, you get this self-bias voltage building up. You stop the self-bias voltage, and the, way, the manner in which it discharges is, is quite interesting. It contains information about electron temperatures over here and about ion fluxes in this rate of discharge here. That's because you've got an external capacitor that's been charged up by the plasma, and when it discharges because you've stopped this RF bias, it's, it's increasing in potential because ions are arriving at the surface. So it's a good way of probing ions. Uh, and here is some, some real data from earlier this week of what was actually happening. This is a ground electrode, and here is surprise number one. Ground electrode, uh, probing electrode structure inserted within it. You'd think that the plasma would see all of this ground electrode and decide what its floating potential is with respect to ground. And a small probe area in the middle of it, completely floating, would take the message from the rest of that large area of electrode and said, well, I'll be at ground potential as well, because it's the same kind of electron and ion fluxes approaching them both. But you see, when we take our RF burst off and say, OK, relax, positive ions arrive, you just relax, 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 and it doesn't stop at ground. It goes up on this occasion to 6 volts, Change the chemistry, make it an argon oxygen plasma, and you can have this thing move down to here. This, this floating potential of an isolated object in the middle of an earthed electrode is, uh, is not earth. And that tells of the fact that there are, in fact, uh, there must be currents flowing within that ground electrode. In fact, if you put the plasma off at this stage, so this is an RF burst just for probing purposes, the plasma is pulsed as well, and they're synchronized. Put the plasma off at this stage, and you see the potential here. This is the decay of the electron temperature, if you like. The potential goes down, and it ends up at ground potential. So, I mean, it's not to do with um, using AC coupling on the oscilloscope or some mistake like that. We can see it go to ground potential when we switch the experiment off. So what you can do with that, because the, the rate at which it discharges is controlled by an external capacitor, you can look at pulsed plasmas in this way, where the, each one of these things looks like a, it corresponds with a plasma pulse, but it's, it's better here. Burst of RF, but at this portion, the plasma's off, so there's no ion flux to arrive at the probe, very little ion flux. Then the plasma switches on, and we get a large ion flux towards the surface, 
and that creates a rapid rate of change of potential here. Then the plasma goes off again, then it comes on again, then it goes off again. So we can get it walking up like that and look at these various afterglow portions here. Look at the iron flux as it goes down and we could try to get in and look at some electron temperature in there as well. That would be a later experiment. Well, then I wanted to arrive at this point, which was to say, well, suppose this is the floating potential that it's got, the one that isn't ground, the one that it sits at when the plasma's on. And this is it decaying because the plasma's gone away. I haven't biased my surface, I'm just letting it be biased by the plasma. Then it comes down towards ground, and then I put on a burst of my radio frequency onto this little probing circuit. Only about 20 volts of RF. 20 volts of RF. And if, if we hadn't had any plasmas in there before, nothing would happen with 20 volts of RF. Quite benign. But because we've just had a plasma, what happens is 20 volts of RF begins to charge the surface, and then when we stop our RF, it's biased. And it's becoming less, there's a rate of change of voltage here because ions are arriving at the surface. So this little test surface has remade some plasma because electrons were careless enough to be hanging around in that space. They'd gone cold, a little bit of RF, picks them up, does some ionization, and then we can see that happening. So what happens if we wait a bit longer? Let's just wait a little bit longer. How long have we waited? What's this time here? This is a millisecond. So we've waited about a millisecond. It's actually about 800 microseconds, I think, something like that. And there's still electrons around that we can pick up and excite. So we'll just wait a bit longer. That's waiting a bit longer. Only that much longer, from there to there. It's only a few tens of microseconds longer. And now, when we've come in on, it's the red curve. It, it, it makes a bit of plasma, but it doesn't make anything like as much. It seems perhaps it's being a little bit more localized. So we'll wait just a little bit longer and see what happens. And we wait now until down here. So we've, we've barely moved it another 10 microseconds later. And now we put our burst of RF on, and nothing happens. So eventually, there comes a time when those electrons have just got too sparse to be picked up and do, to, to do any uh, multiplication. But they haven't really gone, they're just too sparse. Why don't we hit them a bit harder? So if you increase the amount of RF voltage that you put on here, then you can begin to get a little bit more ionization to happen, even at this late stage. But there must come a time, if you go down here, there must come a time when eventually those electrons have all gone. And all, they're all, well, where have they gone? They've all gone onto surfaces, they've come out of the volume, but unless they've, they've done some recombining, they're available to be pulled off the surfaces and to do some more ionization. Well, that's related to what, what we saw in this case here when I said we have the measurements of electron density in a pulsed afterglow 500 microseconds, 400 microseconds after the afterglow started, the electron density is still bigger than 10 to the 15 per cubic meter. Sorry, they're very modern units. Greater than 10 to the whatever it would be, 10 to the 20. Never mind, we'll leave it at 10 to the 15. I can't do the sums. But that's a lot of electrons still around after 400 microseconds. So after a millisecond, it's still a significant number. And so, to the modeling. Possibly with Quantumol D and the hybrid plasma equipment model of Mark Kushner. What we need to do to do that modeling is to, to create a space that's got, well, this is an inductive plasma version of it, so there's a dielectric barrier there. This is empty space in the darkest color. Here is an earthed electrode, and here is one of my probing surfaces within the earthed electrode. And what I'd like to know is, does sampling around here tell me something about the general condition of the volume or conditions around that space? Uh, first results a little bit difficult to get hold of, but there clearly is some influence around here of potentials on this surface. That's good, but that's just in a sort of average steady state. Uh, measurements of this, this is the electrode again, ground electrode and the inductive coil up here. This is looking at iron flux. Blue colors are ions moving downwards. Red colors are ions moving upwards. And ions were involved in the discharging of my surface here. So there's a slight color change there. It indicates that maybe I'm beginning to run the model well enough to see what's happening. But I'm not a modeler, and running other people's models is probably harder than writing the model yourself, but it's a darn sight quicker. So you have to find some kind of compromise like that. What I do know is that as a function of time, if I have a pulsed plasma, the electron density can keep getting 
we keep exciting on the rising portion and then it relaxes because the plasma is off, on, off like that. And we can get to a sort of steady state. And looking at my floating area without put, trying to put any voltage on it, it's just acquiring a natural voltage and then decaying again. It acquires the voltage and decays again. So we are talking to my little probe surface in there, but I still have no confidence in my ability to run this code, and that's why I'm not showing you hard results and, and real numbers coming out. But that's the reason I want to know, does sampling at the boundary reflect conditions in the, vo in, in the volume for the temporal behavior of these discharges? So, time to draw to a close and say why we're interested in 2D modeling of transient phenomena in plasmas is because I want to answer the question, does sampling at the boundary reflect conditions in the volume? It's very good, I mean commercially, as, as a means of working with the, say, the semiconductor industry who will put nothing in the plasma that isn't a wafer, then you've got to work in the surfaces. And you can try getting photons out, They're, they come for free, but getting anything in there is really difficult. So the, the, I'm trying to get the question, can I sit at the, at the boundary and very simply, terribly simply, electrically, find out what's going on in the plasma volume? Things about the electron density and its distribution is it, is it uniform? Things about the distribution of ion flux, things about the composition. Because remember, Mike, the, the, the floating potential, if I put it into an argon plasma, it's up here. If I put it in an argon oxygen plasma, depending on how much oxygen I put in, I can move it up and down. So it is representative, it is diagnostic of what's going on in some sense in practice. But can I understand enough through this sort of thing with, with 2D effects to get real understanding of the temporal behavior in that environment? That's what's driving me. Thank you.